welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. Greetings, Neil. It's great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. Me too. Great. Um, now, before we go into the meat of our conversation, I do like to ask something about uh, my guest's origin stories. So tell me a bit more about your origin story. What did you study at university? Would it be, was it inevitable you, you would have ended up going down this academic route, uh, quite illustrious academic route that you've uh, ended up going down? Historical inevitability is one of these things that I'm skeptical about, and my own life is no exception. I was born in Glasgow in 1964 uh, to a, a doctor and a physics teacher, and uh, grew up part, part of my early childhood uh, was in Kenya, but mostly I grew up in the west of Scotland. I discovered early on a facility for writing, I was a decent mathematician, but uh, but I was really good at writing and enjoyed it. And uh, was encouraged by my grandfather, who was uh, a journalist, he'd been the chief sub-editor of the Glasgow Herald, to think of writing as a legitimate profession, which I don't think uh, was a standard view. But, but he certainly made me feel that I could think of writing for a living. And that appealed. I didn't know what kind of writing, though. Uh, I remember discovering a book by A.J.P. Taylor in my parents' library, An Illustrated History of the First World War, when I was really very young, and that impressed me deeply. He became a hero, and I thought, well, I should go to where he teaches. And this was all before the internet. So I, I had this book, and it said that he was a fellow at Magdalen College, Oxford. So I thought, well, I'd, I'll go there. And it never occurred to me that he might have left. So that by the time I got to Oxford, he, he'd gone. But the project of, of history as a route to writing was there from relatively early on. I just tried everything else first. I mean, I, like a lot of my generation, thought of Oxford and Cambridge as the places that produced Monty Python. And so I went through a phase of acting and, and comedy. Then I tried journalism. I tried a whole variety of different activities, failed at them all, and concluded after a couple of years, better stick to writing history. That that seems to be what works. And I've been doing that ever since with, uh, with reasonable success. And uh, I guess that's what I'll, I'll keep doing. But I don't know, maybe if I'd been, maybe if I'd had a, a lucky break earlier on, I'd, I'd now be a comedian. Uh, and, and maybe if Sasha Baron Cohen, who was one of my students, um, had been a little bit more conscientious, he, he might have ended up being a professor. So there's a lot of contingency in, in human life. And I, I don't regard any of this as inevitable. I've just been quite lucky. And so actually, you, you kind of told me off there a bit about inevitability and history. And so you seem to have a very clear view of the contingency of history. Um, so can you talk a bit more about that? Because there is this sort of sense, maybe it's a Marxist thing or something, this inevitability, you know, we're all kind of going in the same direction. But you, you're, you you know, from your writings, you, you take a stand apart from that or away from that, or in opposition to that, I should say. Yes, many years ago, 30 years ago, I think it must be now, I edited a collection of essays on counterfactuals, what-if questions in history. That book was called Virtual History. And it came out of realizing that there are two profoundly different philosophical approaches to the past. The deterministic approach is to say that what happened was bound to happen, and therefore there's no point in asking what-if questions. They're, they're merely a kind of entertainment. And that's not just a Marxist view. There are lots of different ways of thinking of history as deterministic. Uh, and, uh, for example, Tolstoy's War and Peace ends with an essay in which he says, essentially, it was bound to happen the way it happened. It's just an illusion that we have agency, an illusion that we have free will. So it wasn't just the Marxists. A lot of different 19th century theories of history were deterministic. And I felt from very early on in my in the most being, this is wrong. 
and that in reality, the historical process is very open, uh, open to individual uh, decisions, open to accidents, to contingencies, and that our human desire to have a kind of closed deterministic history, which is at some level predictable, is, is just an aberration because we can't handle the uncertainty of a highly contingent historical process. So in the book, Virtual History, there's a long introduction, which is really my philosophy of history. And in it, I say, the truth is that, that the world's a complex system. It's characterized uh, in many ways by, by chaos. Uh, and, uh, and that means that we need to be aware of, uh, of counterfactuals and contingencies to understand the past. And the example that I, I spent a lot of time on then was the outbreak of World War I, which is an overdetermined event in most of the literature, but in reality happened because of a series of miscalculations uh, at, at, at the highest level of the great uh, powers of, of, of Europe. In the cabinet meeting where Britain decided on war on August the 2nd, 1914, Lloyd George might well have argued against war. And that that's kind of what you'd have expected based on his record as a, a man of the left, a man of the people. But but he didn't. Uh, and that surprised his colleagues who, who were on the dovish side. That's the kind of thing that interests me. There's a there's a parallel universe uh where where Lloyd George does argue against intervention and Britain stays out and the war is not a world war it's a shortish european war that's over by 1916 i much prefer to think of the historical process in that way because i think it captures the uncertainty of the present better you and i don't really know what's going to happen this year maybe even tonight uh and so how can it be that the historical process is deterministic if we if we can't even be sure what the terminal rate of Fed funds will be, if we can't be sure if there'll be a war over Taiwan or not, if we can't be sure if the war in Ukraine will end or not. We live under great uncertainty, and so did people in the past. Nobody in 1914, on the morning of August the 2nd, including members of the cabinet, knew that Britain was going to decide uh, on war that day. And it's much better to embrace that uncertainty and recognize the role of of contingency and realize that to the contemporaries, there are plausible futures. There are other futures, including one in which Britain stands aside of, uh, of the war. That's really my, my credo. And I'm absolutely sure that philosophically that's correct. And that those people who argue for deterministic models of history are wrong. They really profoundly wrong. The amazing thing is that they remain dominant in the academy. They shouldn't be. They should have lost this argument long ago. I, I was going to ask you that. I mean, why haven't they lost this argument? Because it sounds quite compelling. And, uh, you know, when you tr when you translate it to today, like we don't know anything about that terminal rate. It makes so much sense. Yeah. Why have you had so much opposition with this counterfactual view? I mean, well, well you know, is it, you know, just in you know, it'll take time, you know, 20, 30 years, it'll move. But is there something inherent about this deterministic way of looking at things that's very attractive? Well, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question because it's so clearly, uh, it's so clearly correct. Any statement of a causal nature, this is well known to philosophers and philosophers, particularly of the law, implies a counterfactual. If we say, uh, that Brexit wouldn't have happened if Boris Johnson hadn't backed it, then there's a counterfactual implied in which Johnson decides to stick with Cameron and Osborne and the referendum goes a different way. So we, we implied the counterfactual. Now, if you've implied it, then why not make it explicit? And what's amazing to me is that the opponents of counterfactual historiography, say Richard Evans, the former Regis professor at Cambridge, in their own books, they state, that there are contingencies. In his own history of the Third Reich, he acknowledges that there were moments that things could have gone differently. So it's, to me, completely baffling that a man like Evans doesn't see, therefore, that counterfactual approaches to history are not just legitimate, but they're indispensable, or all your causal statements are just worthless assertions. 
I think it's hard. I mean, the truth of the matter is, it's just much easier to tell history like a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end's kind of a foregone conclusion. That's just easier. Whereas the counterfactual approach implies multiple historical worlds, multiple 20th centuries in which things don't go the same way, in which there's a kind of Monte Carlo simulation. And in at least some of those 20th centuries, Britain enters the war, but it, perhaps a majority it doesn't. And that's just harder. It's just more challenging intellectually. It's also difficult to do in practice because if you're going to write history which is alive to the counterfactual, there have to be some constraining rules. And one of the ones that I proposed was that you should only consider counterfactuals that contemporaries considered. And that's really a good constraint because we know that there were people in 1914 arguing against British intervention. And therefore, it's quite legitimate to talk about that scenario. There were, I don't think, many people who were arguing that Britain should take Germany's side. Um, and so that's not worth uh, discussing. So there, there are kind of rules uh, to apply. And I, I've just observed over time that most people who want to be historians and get paid to be historians don't want to think that hard. Yeah, yeah. No, I can, I can see where you're coming from. Now, we did talk about World War One, and some people have been saying that the Russia-Ukraine war currently is the beginning of a World War Three. You know, you have a, a war in you know, Eastern Europe going on. It could sort of spill over, break up things in, 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 in Europe. I mean, as, as a historian and somebody who looks at, uh, you know, contemporary society as well, you know, how, how do you look at something like the Russia-Ukraine conflict? Well, I saw it coming. I remember... Uh, in September of, of 2021, coming back from Kyiv thinking there is going to be a war because Putin had published his article on the historical unity of the Russian and Ukrainian people. And the US response had been, well, if you do that, we'll, we'll impose such terrible sanctions on you as you'll ever have seen. And, and that was obviously not going to deter Putin. On January the 2nd of 2022, I wrote a piece for Bloomberg, which began war is coming. I don't think that this particular war has the potential to lead to World War III in the way that uh, the war uh, over Bosnia that broke out uh, between Serbia and Austria-Hungary had the potential to become a world war. Because uh, there aren't the same chain reactions that can happen uh, that would bring other European powers into the conflict, some on the side of Ukraine and some on the side of and some on the side of Russia. Uh, that's not the risk here. But the risk here is much more analogous to the risks of the Cold War. And I think this war is much more like the Korean War than it is like uh, anything that happened in the run-up to 1914 in the Balkans. The Korean War was the first hot war, the first real hot war of Cold War I, and the war in Ukraine is the first hot war of, of Cold War II. Cold War II is different because it's primarily between the United States and China. And the question of the moment is how far will China support Russia, not just economically, which it is doing, but but with lethal aid, which the US says is a red line. The US is already, of course, supplying Ukraine with massive amounts of lethal aid. In fact, it's the key reason why Ukraine is still in this war. If China continues increasing its support at, to the point of supplying, say, drones or or missiles, that, that will take us into very dangerous territory comparable with the early 1950s. And that's, I think, a much more useful analogy uh, because I think Cold War II is the right framework for thinking about the world today. The real danger is not actually in Eastern Europe uh, unless you take Putin's threats of using a tactical nuclear weapon very seriously and literally. The real threat is actually what happens elsewhere at the same time. Because if you simultaneously get a crisis over Iran, say Israel attacks Iran to 
degrade its nuclear weapons capabilities. And at the same time, China attacks Taiwan, then you have something that is quite world war like. And it'd be very difficult for the United States and its allies to cope with that simultaneous three region crisis. So that's the way I'm thinking about this war. Uh, it's a war that's not about to stop uh, uh, in a hurry because uh, wars like this just keep going. Uh, I will be very surprised if it's not still going a year from now. Rather like the Korean War, it's kind of going to get into a phase of attrition. It's already kind of there. Um, and it will be hard to stop. But the big question is not, does it escalate in Europe? I don't think Russia can escalate in Europe. It's barely able to hold its own in Ukraine. The question is, does it escalate elsewhere? And do you get real coordination between Russia, China, and Iran? That's already kind of happening. There is a real axis there. And American and indeed uh, US allied policymakers should be very worried about that. And so you've talked about Cold War too, and this is something you were very early on talking about this, this conflict. I mean, how, first of all, what are the similarities with Cold War One, and what are the differences with Cold War One? Well, it's a great question because World War One and World War Two were exactly the same, but people still use that nomenclature. And I think it's appropriate here too, because sure, there are some obvious differences of which the biggest is the extent of the economic interpenetration of the United States and the People's Republic of China. That's unlike anything that we saw uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. It's also very significant. The Chinese economy is much larger, partly as a consequence of that interpenetration than the Soviet economy ever was on a purchasing power parity basis. It's larger already than the United States economy, not on a current dollar basis. So those are a, a two important uh, differences. But in every other respect, I think it's the same. There's an ideological dimension to it. Some people deny that. I was debating that with Martin Guri yesterday. But of course it's ideological. Xi Jinping's explicitly said that he is hostile to democracy, he's hostile to the rule of law, he's hostile to a free press. Those things can't be taught at Chinese universities. Uh, and so I think it is ideological. It's also obviously geographical. There are certain regions that are being contested. But above all, it's a technological race, which is what Cold Wars tend to be. Uh, Cold War One was a race, particularly in the realm of nuclear arms, uh, but also space and satellite technology. This Cold War is about those things, but it's also about uh, artificial intelligence and, and quantum computing and much else, battery technology for that matter. So I think it, it's sufficiently similar to be described as Cold War Two, And I think it's a very heuristically useful about nomenclature, because up until I started making this argument, which was in 2018, Americans were totally asleep. They didn't realize that from the Chinese vantage point, the Cold War had already begun. I think Xi Jinping basically started it by aspiring to primacy, or at least parity, in the Indo-Pacific region, and by embarking on a really extraordinary uh, program of rearmament, by seeking explicitly to challenge uh, the United States and to establish China as an equal, if not superior, great power. All of that's been going on since uh, for more than 10 years. But Americans were really kind of asleep until, of all people, Donald Trump woke them up. Uh, and Trump intended only a trade war, not a Cold War. The Cold War kind of happened almost despite him. Because in the course of his presidency, more and more Americans said, you know what, tariffs aren't enough. We, we have to stop Huawei taking over global comms. We, we have to do a bunch more. And that's, I think, how the Cold War was born in the United States, almost as an unintended consequence of Trump's tariffs. I mean, is, is there a way for the two powers to just coexist and for it not to be a war, you know, of whatever kind, hot or cold war? Can't you just have two big powerful blocks, two military blocks, they trade with each other, they may not like each other's ideology, but, you know, let's not have a war about this. Well, if Graham Allison, my old friend at Harvard, were here, he would say, ask the Spartans and the Athenians, <laughs> uh, or ask the Brits and the Germans in the 20th century. The, the truth is that 
that kind of coexistence between two comparably large uh, powers is quite rare historically. It, it proved difficult even in Cold War I to achieve because if you remember, by the time of, of the late 60s when Vietnam had gone terribly wrong and the arms race had become almost uh, insane because both superpowers had such vast arsenals, there was an attempt to to achieve peaceful coexistence. It was called detente. Uh, it was central to Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger's approach. And it got, you know, quite far. But gradually, in the course of the 70s, it dawned on Americans that really the Soviets uh, were not good faith participants in detente. They, they intended to use every opportunity that presented itself to advance their... Uh, the geopolitical and, and ideological interests. And so Detente died by 1979. It, it basically lasted 10 years. And it became one of the bases for Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign, that he was against it and believed in a much tougher approach. And that tougher approach in the 1980s worked and led to, to US victory. So I think the lesson of the first Cold War is that while it would be nice to have peaceful coexistence, it takes two to tango. And totalitarian regimes aren't that good at it, that they're always kind of tempted to to exploit the opportunities that present themselves. Where, and, and that was what happened. I mean, the Soviets could keep their hands off sub-Saharan Africa. They couldn't keep out of uh, parts of the world where opportunities arose. And, and that, I think, helped to undermine uh, detente. So I, I I think at the moment there are people in Washington and Beijing who would quite like to do detente, but I bet they fail. Yeah. And in terms of the ideology, I mean, again, going back to contingency, I mean, could, could there have been a path or is there a path for China to become a liberal democracy, you know, like Japan or Korea or, or not? Well, I don't think those analogies work because once a communist party is in power it is highly unlikely to accept a transition to multi-party free elections because it's obvious that that would be curtains so in particular with china the lesson of the soviet experience is don't do what gorbachev did i mean that is the thing that Xi Jinping thinks before he has breakfast every day, don't be Gorbachev, don't make those mistakes, don't allow transparency, don't allow uh, people to criticize the way things are run because the legitimacy of the regime will collapse and you'll, be en you'll end up with not only a kind of dysfunctional democracy, but a completely collapsed economy. So there's no way that there was no way the Chinese Communist Party was ever going to do glasnost and perestroika. They regarded that as as just a kind of insane act of self-immolation by Gorbachev. I think that it's possible in our lifetimes that the Chinese Communist Party will experience what their Soviet counterparts experienced, namely that without economic growth and in the face of structural dysfunction, the legitimacy of the regime disintegrates. I think there are lots of things very wrong with uh, Xi Jinping's China. The demographics are terrible, the debt dynamics are terrible, the growth rates clearly heading to low single digits. They also find themselves, I think, confronting uh, a quite dangerous uh, isolation. I mean, who are their allies? That would be Russia, North Korea, and Air Venezuela. That's not a great list to invite to a party. So I, I could see ways in which the Soviet failure could replay itself in China. It's just the timing that's hard to call. Plus, if we go in hard on issues like Taiwan or Hong Kong or Xinjiang, the more combative the US is, the more inadvertently we legitimize the regime and allow Xi Jinping to play the nationalist card to salvage the reputation of the CCP. So in a way, Cold War II serves China's interests too. It serves the CCP's interests too, because in that atmosphere, 
internal dissent is is harder to sustain and easier to suppress. And so, you know, what I mean, how will this Cold War II unfold? You know, some people are talking about a, a China attack on Taiwan. Is that still likely, given Russia's struggles with Ukraine and and in other dimensions? I mean, how how do you think this will unfold? There's no question that that China has considered is considering the possibility of an invasion of Taiwan, but that's a very risky thing to do and a very difficult thing to do. Phobia's landings are hard at the best of times. Taiwan's a real tough one uh, because the strait is quite a hard thing to get across. Uh, but that's not the only scenario that I think we should think about. The the one that I think a lot about is what I'll call the Cuban Missile Crisis scenario, where China quarantines, that was the, the language the US used uh, with respect to Cuba, quarantines, blockades in effect, Taiwan, and then defies the United States to send a naval force to break that blockade. I can imagine that happening. And that being extremely difficult for the United States to contend with, because it would be in the position the Soviets were in in 1962 of having to send a naval expedition a very long way away to run a blockade. So I worry about that because that was the most dangerous moment of Cold War One, and I really don't want us to replay that game over Taiwan when the economic stakes would be much higher. I mean, what was Cuba in 1962? Nothing much. Taiwan is central to the global economy because of the role that TSMC plays in producing the most sophisticated semiconductors. So war over Taiwan would be economically very bad. Uh, and of course, a, a war between the United States and China would be on a much larger scale than Ukraine v. Russia. And it would have a, a significant risk of turning nuclear, given the nature of the forces that would be deployed. So. This is a very bad scenario that we should all be thinking about how to avoid. Uh, but it's it's the way that I think we're, we're currently headed because there is a bipartisan consensus in Congress that the US should have a less ambiguous commitment to Taiwan. Uh, both parties uh, are quite hawkish on the issue and they both seem strangely unaware of how uh, lacking in credibility, American war plans currently are. And, you know, we've talked about the US and China, but obviously there's a another big uh, economic block in between Europe. W where does Europe stand uh, around all of this? I mean, obviously they they, they initially tried to um, uh, be friendly towards Russia with Nord Stream 2 and so on. That, that's backfired on them. Is, is this the moment where Europe stands up with a much more assertive foreign policy, stronger defense and so on? How do you see it? Well, that was the language pre the war in Ukraine. Strategic autonomy uh, was one of the, uh, President Macron's favorite phrases. I can remember being at a conference in Italy in 2021 when uh, Bruno Le Maire uh, had almost a standing ovation in uh, saying that Europe should be a superpower in military terms as well as economic terms. Well, this all looks pretty silly at this point because what the war in Ukraine revealed uh, was that that you, you you know the U.S. is European security, it is European defense. The Europeans got nothing; they really do not have uh, anything resembling strategic autonomy, and they're years and years and billions of euros away from having it. So, I think the way to think about this is that in Cold War One. There was no question that Western Europe had to be aligned with the United States because it was directly menaced by the Soviet Union. And Cold War I was this transatlantic conflict, uh, which was why the North Atlantic Treaty Organization was so central. In Asia, by comparison, there were conflicts uh, in Korea, later in Vietnam, but there was no alliance system nearly as uh, as powerful as NATO and the Warsaw Pact, the Soviets' response to it. In Cold War II, I think it's a trans-Pacific conflict. And what will matter a lot more will be the relationships between the United States and Japan, uh, Australia, uh, South Korea, India. Whereas Europe will not be the central battleground of Cold War 
to it, it, indeed some Europeans are probably thinking to themselves, hey, can we be non-aligned like the Indians were in Cold War One? Can we be the non-aligned people this time? The German business community would love to be non-aligned. The problem for them is that their security depends on the United States. Pretty hard to be non-aligned if you are that reliant on one of the superpowers. So I think Europe has this rather uneasy path ahead of it. It's inextricably dependent on the US for the foreseeable future for its national security. It can't plausibly achieve strategic autonomy. It'd be too expensive. It just doesn't have the the means. Uh, and yet, uh, it would really like to have an ongoing trade relationship and investment relationship with China. Uh, and it's going to be really hard for Europeans to come to terms with the fact that that's probably not a viable future that you're going to have to choose. Uh, and I think that choice may be made in the course of an escalation around Ukraine. If, if the Chinese ignore American warnings and supply lethal aid to Russia, I don't, I don't know that the Europeans will have any choice but to start to reduce their, their ties to China. And, you know, I, I kind of wonder with Europe, I mean, is there any path for them to become a global superpower or, or just more influential globally? They always seem to just not step up when, when the time's needed for them. I mean, what, what would we need to see for that? It's, ex it's really expensive to achieve strategic autonomy. Mm. You'd have to spend a lot more uh, on defense. Of course, one of the consequences of Olaf Scholz's Zeitenwende is that Germany is going to spend more on defense. But I remain to be persuaded that it will spend it sensibly. Because part of the problem in Europe is not just that the defense budgets got squeezed. It's also that the defense sector is a bit like the automobile sector. It's, it's really good if you're still in the 20th century. But in the 21st century, it's not. And uh, it will take a long time for Europe to be competitive in the new world of, of drone technology and all that goes uh, with it. So... I don't know how Europe can get out of this. Uh, it seems to me that Europe is the opposite of an empire. Uh, I called it an empire, I-M-P-I-R-E, in a book called Colossus that I published 20 years ago. The idea being that Europe is big, but it doesn't do what empires do. What empires do is to project power. What Europe does is to kind of bring countries into its uh, trading uh, zone and to some extent monetary zone uh, and provide them with certain institutional incentives. I mean, European expansion has been very good for the East European countries that participated in it. They wouldn't be doing as well if there hadn't been European enlargement. Uh, but it doesn't make Poland more secure to be in the EU. It just makes it richer. It makes Poland more secure to be in NATO. And we shouldn't pretend that it's the EU that gave Europe peace. It was NATO that gave Europe peace by deterring, successfully deterring the Soviet Union from expanding any further west than it did. And where does India come into all of this? You know, India sort of sees itself as um, a rival to China. They're worried, obviously, about China across the border. You know, you know, with Russia, Ukraine, they've been non-aligned, you could say, along with many other countries from the so-called global south. But you know, where does India fit into this? I think it's no longer non-aligned, and that's important because its non-alignment in the first Cold War sometimes verged on leaning towards the Soviets. That was, of course, a consequence of the U.S. tilting towards Pakistan. Today, I think India is clearly closer to the United States than it's ever been. And uh, that has important implications. From a Chinese vantage point, I'll never quite fully grasp this, the, the policy seems to be inflame India, <laughs> uh, kind of get into border fights with sticks and clubs and make sure, as a result, that India is aligned with the United States. I just don't get why they're doing that. On the other hand, I don't think India will be of much use if there's a war over Taiwan. I can imagine Narendra Modi being suddenly very busy when that phone call comes in from Washington, because it's not clear to me that, that 
uh, India would gain anything from that particular conflict, whereas Japan will be all in. Uh, I think in that sense, the Quad has created a slightly sub-NATO level of uh, of political alignment in Asia. I don't think the Quad's anything close to being uh, NATO for Asia, because I think, as we've seen in the case of Ukraine, India will pick its fights according to its national interest, and that rules out Ukraine, and it, it rules out Taiwan too, I suspect. And you, you touched on Iran and Israel earlier. In the Middle East, lots of things have been changing. There seems to be lots of realignments. What are your thoughts on, on the Middle East at the moment? It's a powder keg. I'm afraid that's a cliche, but it's true in a number of respects. Firstly, Iran's inching closer to having weapons-grade uranium and the attempt to resuscitate the Iran nuclear deal has clearly failed. Nobody in Washington any longer thinks that's going to fly. The Iranian regime, meanwhile, has survived a wave of popular protest and is as radical as ever. At the same time, Israel has a government under uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu that is uh, right-wing and uh, I think committed also to stopping Iran getting to be a nuclear weapons power. Iran is taking pot shots at Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis are kind of falling out and it's going to blow at some point. I'm not sure quite uh, how. Perhaps there'll be an Israeli attack on uh, Iran's nuclear facilities or perhaps there'll just be a third intifada. But there's no way the Middle East is more stable 12 months from now than it is today. And that's something that investors need to be very mindful of, because if you are hoping for a soft landing, uh, if you're hoping that the Fed can tame inflation without having to do too much more, you really don't want a Middle Eastern crisis, especially if you know the Iranians get into a real fighting war uh, with a neighbor or near neighbor. So that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, there are all kinds of wheels within wheels, as always in the region. Uh, Israeli domestic politics is going through an extraordinarily fractious phase, and I don't pretend to know how that will turn out. Uh, but I think uh, I think the, the the likelihood that you have stability is in, in the next, let's say, twenty four months is pretty low. Yeah. And, and in terms of other risks, I mean, we've covered a lot of risks so far. Have I have, have we missed anything out? Because I, I can't see that we have, but in case I missed something. I mean, I, the geopolitical risks are, are clear. East, Eastern Europe, things drag on, maybe escalate. Iran or it, its neighborhood blows up and then, and then Taiwan. Th those, I think, are the big three. Uh, let's not forget North Korea. Uh, there's another member of the kind of axis of ill will, which could indeed uh, uh, give us a shock, because it's not as if it stopped uh, acquiring and developing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so that that would be the fourth to mention. But of course, what we've learned in the last few years is that that risks take many forms. We've come through the biggest pandemic since 1918-19. Uh, it's not really entirely over because the virus has not gone away and is capable of further mutation. Uh, there is always, I, I think, uh, uh, a risk of a bigger geological shock than you thought possible. We've just seen a big earthquake in Syria and Turkey. The world's gone through a quiet time geologically in our lifetimes. There haven't been really huge volcanic uh, eruptions. I keep reminding myself that that's the kind of thing that can completely blindside you when it happens. Uh, because as I try to argue in my book, Doom, these things happen sufficiently infrequently and without any pattern that you can forget completely the, the possibility of a massive earthquake where I live, uh, you know, you complain about the rain here, but if there were a really big earthquake, you'd soon forget about you know, rain. California, just for the uh, for, for our listeners. Yeah, correct. Uh, I also spend time in Montana, where there is a super volcano that one day will blow and 
then all talk of global warming will become irrelevant because the world will become a very clouded, cold place. Those things are worth remembering just so we don't get complacent. And of course, Manchester City could overhaul Arsenal and win the Premier League, dashing the hopes of uh, of all uh, right-thinking football fans. Uh, how much more can we worry about in one podcast? I think that must be the limit. Yeah. Now, I did want to ask um, something about academia and the state of universities in the US. Um, you know, I went to university, Cambridge, in the 1990s, and there was a certain environment. But today, what I hear what it's like in universities, especially in the US, it does seem like there's been a shift in the culture at universities where it's much harder to be open. Um, there's a lot more focus on how you talk about things and the language you use and not causing offense. I mean, is, is that just hyped up in the media by, you know, old conservative people? But what, what's it like on campus? I mean, do, do you worry about uh, the academy or not? It's understated in the media because uh, a lot of journalists are about your age and they remember university in the 1990s. <laughs> I taught at Cambridge in the 1990s and I think I enjoyed as complete uh, free speech as it's possible to achieve. I was at Peter House and we were re regularly, almost routinely outrageous in the things that we said <laughs> in supervisions as well as at high table and in public. Things are terrible. Uh, in the United States in particular, the elite universities have become hotbeds of intolerance and illiberal behavior as well as thought. This has happened quite quickly. It wasn't true when I first uh, taught at Harvard back in the uh, early 2000s. But by 2016, it started to be obvious that the classroom uh, and campus culture had changed much for the worse. Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff have a book, The Coddling of the American Mind, that offers an explanation uh, for this, that the new generation, Generation Z, <laughs> who are currently undergraduates, are uh, strangely fragile, uh, hypersensitive and thin-skinned because they were given cell phones too early or because their parents are too protective. Uh, Jonathan Haidt's doing a lot more work on this uh, and emphasizes the smartphones and social media. But that is not enough, in my view, to explain what's happened. It may explain why the students are very ready to go and denounce one another or their professors, but you also have to explain why vast administrators, uh, vast administrations of diversity, equity, and inclusion officers and Title IX officers have sprung up, eager to take the side of fragile students and that's a very peculiar American pathology. We have more administrators at Yale now than undergraduates. And that army of bureaucrats, I think, are probably more damaging than the fragile undergraduates. And then you've got the you know traditional uh, monstrous regiment of woke professors. It's a pretty unholy trinity, therefore, of, of, of snowflake students uh, woke administrators and right on uh, uh, professors, they seem to have, and this is surprising, created almost a totalitarian culture. It's sort of cultural revolution light in which denunciation is routine. People are constantly writing emails, denouncing uh, colleagues, uh, contemporaries, professors, and uh, unleashing these very... Uh, legally dubious investigations, uh, which often lead to cancellation. Uh, tenure doesn't mean anything, as Joshua Katz found at Princeton. It's a mess. And it's depressing, because these are the commanding heights of American education, and uh, it can't be healthy for a generation that will be running the country one day to have four years in this atmosphere of self-censorship and, and mistrust. But that's where we are. And I, I, I do think it's much worse than the media coverage would lead you to believe. Uh, you just have to actually be on a campus and experience the mutual uh, suspicion and paranoia uh, to, to appreciate how much worse things are than they were when you were an undergraduate at Cambridge. I mean, does that make you worried about the American project? Because I know, you know, in your writings in the past, you've been very positive about the American future. I mean, does this concern you or, or not? 
Well, my writings are not, I think, uh, unambiguously positive about the American future. Colossus was published 20 years ago or thereabouts, and it was The Decline and Fall of America's Empire. That was the subtitle. Uh, the book Civilization warns that a the period of Western preeminence is coming to an end, uh, and uh, and I still think that's a significant risk. The Great Degeneration warned that the biggest threats to uh, Western predominance were from within, and I think uh, the Square in the Tower and then Doom uh, provide supporting evidence role of the internet, I think, has not been uh, on balance positive for our American political culture. And, uh, you know, in Doom, I, I make the point that the worst thing in the 20th century, the most disastrous thing was totalitarianism. That was what killed the most people prematurely. And to find students and, and indeed, in some cases, professors behaving voluntarily without there being a dictator in power, behaving uh, like characters in 1930s Russia or 1960s China is deeply shocking to me because people are capable of writing letters of denunciation. They're capable of anything. To me, it's an act of grotesque moral turpitude to write a letter uh, of that sort. And yet within the current generation of students, this is regarded as almost a heroic act. So we're in a very dangerous uh, situation to the point that I don't think the the, the existing universities can be salvaged. And that's why I'm involved in creating a new university in Austin, Texas, in the belief that if one institution can model real academic and intellectual freedom, there'll be at least some pressure on the others to, uh, to copy it because we'll start attracting the smartest students. Because the students hate all this. The really smart people don't want to be in you know a woke version of North Korea. And so if we create a university that's for real about uh, the Chicago principles rather than just stating them and then not applying them, we'll start attracting talent. So that's a big part of what I'm, I'm currently engaged in doing. That's great. I mean, that, that, you know, is there a name for that university or a project? I mean, is there something? Well, it's, it's not allowed to be a university until it's been accredited, such as the power of bureaucracy. Okay. So we, are, we call ourselves UATX, which is short for University of Austin. Texas. So UATX is is the the project, and it's part of a concerted effort uh, I'm making to found new institutions on both sides of the Atlantic that will advance the cause of individual uh, freedom, uh, which is central to the the Western project. If we lose that, then uh, then we lose everything. Okay. Wow, that's quite sobering. Sobering thought there. I mean, I did want to round off with a couple of personal questions, and perhaps one which may be apt, is around what advice would you give to youngsters who are leaving university? Um, leaving it or going? Leaving it to enter the job market and, you know, entering the wide world. I mean, what, what, what advice do you give such, you know, students? Read. Read. And don't just read what they, they tell you to read. Uh, the, the most serious problem for anyone aged around 20 is you've almost certainly not read enough because you've been distracted in ways that my generation weren't. And, uh, and reading is uh, the key to uh, all the achievements of, of civilization, nearly all of them. And if you don't, you know, if you haven't read War and Peace, are you really, do you really understand War and Peace? To give just one example, if you've never read a novel by Thomas Hardy, do you really understand the nature of contingency in, in human relations? So read, just read. You haven't read enough. You're way off. You're way behind. You need to spend much more time reading and you need to stop doing things that, that stop you reading. And that means avoid doom scrolling. Don't watch television. Just focus on reading. Less TikTok and more reading. That's great advice. Zero, zero TikTok. You should never go on TikTok. It's, uh, it's actually an instrument of the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah. And speaking about reading, you've written lots of books. Um, I write as a researcher as well. I want to know how how are you able to write so many books? What's your secret of of like what your productivity seems to be incredibly high? By Scottish standards, I'm thinking here of Walter Scott and John Buck, and I'm I'm a slouch. Uh, but I I have uh, long believed that in order to 
benefit from the reading that you do, you have to be able to distill it into uh, your own thoughts. Uh, and so all my books really arise from a desire to understand the world better and to explain it to myself better. Uh, so I'm I'm always engaged in, in writing, even if it's only maintaining notes on the week as it unfolds. I have a book project at the moment, which is proving enormously intractable, uh, the second volume of my biography of Henry Kissinger. And that's, that's an Everest-like uh, challenge because there's so much material. But writing a book is the easy part. The hard part is thinking. You can gather all the material, you can read and read and read, but at some point you have to think and order the material. And I think we aren't good at that. We don't teach students to do that very well. And I, when I was a teacher, would spend a lot of my time trying to get students to leave space between the reading and the writing to do the hard bit, which is thinking. Now, most people don't know how to think. Uh, they, they, they're really mentally amazingly unfit. If, if their bodies looked like their brains, they'd be covered in shame. Mm -hmm. And so most people need to train much harder to think, to order their thoughts, to make sure that in response to a question, they can quickly structure their answer. Uh, and I think that's, that's the part of writing that's hard. Once you've thought it through, then it's just, you know, a question of overcoming repetitive strain injury to get it down on paper. And speaking of books, I mean, were there certain books that really influenced you in, in the way you look at the world? I've mentioned uh, War and Peace, which was certainly a book that turned me towards history, even though it's a historical novel. Um, I've, made, I've mentioned A.J.P. Taylor. The Struggle for Mastery uh, is one of his great books and uh, a masterpiece of, of elegant prose. Anybody who wants to write history needs to read Gibbon's, uh, at least part of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. I was made to do it as an undergraduate at, at Oxford. I could go on. Uh, I'll, 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 pause, I'll pause there because uh, like, like many uh, an Oxford don, I have this urge to give people long reading lists off the top <laughs> of my head. I'm getting cold sweats just thinking about supervisions now <laughs> and uh, getting those reading lists. Um, and your most recent book was uh, Doom, um, uh, about the pandemic and catastrophes. And well, it wasn't really about the pandemic. The last few chapters were, but it was really a, a history of disaster uh, okay, with yeah. the subtitle, The Politics of Catastrophe. The argument being that all disasters are at some level politically constructed, whether you call them natural or man-made. And I'm proud of that book because a lot of what it said, it was written in 2020, a lot of what it said towards the end about where the world was going turned out to be very right, in particular that a pandemic would likely be followed by a war and that China would turn out to have done much worse than everybody thought in 2020. So those were good calls and they, they tell me that I'm, I'm working on the history of the present and future quite successfully. Yeah. And, and you know, um, as well as your academic work, you, you also have a number of other kind of uh, initiatives and, and companies that you run. What's, uh, what are some of the ones you want to highlight and what's the way people can follow your work? Well, I realized in, I think it was 2011, that the world was going, at least the world of academia was going mad. And I created uh, something called Greenmantle, which is an advisory business. It's very deliberately not public. Uh, only clients uh, of Greenmantle get Greenmantle research. And, uh, and we have a very exclusive group of clients uh, ranging from giants like uh, Citadel and Blackstone to some of the uh, smaller but most impactful uh, hedge funds. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very happy with the way that's evolved because we really just do applied history. Our basic framework is everything has some kind of historical perspective. If you want to think about the bond market or Fed policy or the next presidential election or the war in Ukraine, you need some historical perspective. And that's what we provide. I publish a fortnightly column for Bloomberg Opinion, which is, I guess, Green Mantle Light. Often it contains insights that we've come up with at the company. Uh, and that is, I think, pretty accessible. I don't think those columns are behind a paywall. Uh, so 
that's really it. That plus the books and yeah. uh, and the podcasts, of which I'm now doing too many, uh, and I I really must dial it back. Uh, especially as somebody pointed out to me, my 11 year old son uh, pointed out that that a podcast doesn't induce people to buy a book; it it's a substitute for buying the book. And so, when you talk about a book on a podcast, you're more or less guaranteeing a reduction in book sales. Well, I'll make sure to add a link uh, to your book, so the most recent one for sure, and a link to Green Mantle and perhaps your most recent column as well, so people know how to get to you. But I would urge people to read uh, read your book. Uh, your, your most recent book, Doom, is, is very, very good. And I look forward to the sort of volume two of Kissinger. I don't want to put any pressure on you. <laughs> in well, I need to go back to that as soon as this call is over, back to the uh, the intricate uh, maneuverings of, of 1974, which is where I currently am. Yeah. Well, well, with that, I mean, it's been fantastic speaking to you, and I really look forward to just reading all of your work going forward. Um, it's been really well, uh, great conversation with you. Thanks a lot, Bilal. It's been a pleasure, and uh, always nice for an Oxford man to talk to at Cambridge. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.